Uh, ben Shapiro, you're followed by millions of people online and on social media. You're one of the biggest names in American conservatism. What is it you think you're tapping into? Well, I think that there are, there are a couple of things. One, there is actually a hunger for different ideas. The, the monolithic nature of the United States media is pretty evident in terms of its politics. People tend to agree on essentially the liberal point of view and increasingly a, a radical leftist point of view in the media. And obviously, I speak to, in response to that. At the same time, uh, I try to provide an honest take on the issues of the day, and that means that I am not beholden to the Republican Party, for example. Uh, it means that I am going to speak out whenever I think that a principle is being violated, just no matter who is doing the violation. You work for the right-wing Breitbart website, uh, but you left over its support for Donald Trump. And I think you said you'd never vote for Mr. Trump. Why is that? Well, in 2015, uh, 2016, the Breitbart made a, a hard turn in favor of one particular candidate, and that's their prerogative. Lots of publications have an editorial point of view, and Breitbart was one of those. The reason that I left Breitbart specifically was because, was because of an incident in which a Breitbart reporter, a female reporter, was grabbed on the arm by Corey Lewandowski, then the campaign manager for President Trump, uh, and was bruised on the arm, and then Corey Lewandowski proceeded to lie about it, and Breitbart proceeded to throw its own reporter under the bus, suggest that she was lying or making this up. And at that point, I determined that I could no longer work for a publication that wasn't even willing to stand up for its own reporters and instead would throw those reporters under the bus in favor of a candidate that it sought to back. Haven't you lost your battle for the Republican Party, though? Isn't the Republican Party now the party of Trump? No, I mean, I think that the Republican Party is always the party of whomever is the president, technically speaking. But in terms of who are the sort of the thought leaders inside the conservative movement, who are the people who are driving a lot of the discussion inside the conservative movement, I don't think that's correct at all. I think that most Republicans see President Trump as a vehicle for their policy preferences, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they agree with all of his personal foibles or the way that he behaves or the things that he says. And I think a lot of Republicans respond in anger to the media attacking President Trump mainly out of a, a reactionary and half appropriate upset that the media seem to have a double standard when it comes to covering certain politicians. I'm interested that you think there's a thought movement inside the Republican Party. I mean, haven't the conservatives... Uh run out of ideas in America, all the new policies, the Medicare for all, $15 minimum wage, the Green New Deal, they're all coming from the left, and they're popular. Well, Frank, fr I mean, frankly, I'm confused by the idea that any of those are, are particularly new ideas. I mean, most of those ideas have been around since Franklin Delano Roosevelt at the very earliest, or at the very latest, rather. Some of them go all the way back to Woodrow Wilson. But the idea that new ideas are absent in the Republican Party is obviously untrue. We have a, a very strong debate that goes on inside sort of the, the conservative halls of intelligentsia uh, about what is the appropriate action to take with regard to the medical system. Should global warming be considered uh, a real threat or should global warming be, be considered something that technology will solve? And if so, what are the best, best aspects of, of solving that? Now, there's a, there's a rich intellectual debate on the right about nationalism versus patriotism, for example, or populism versus free marketeerism. That debate is happening on the right to, to sort of suggest that the right in America is bereft of ideas, but the left is full of ideas. Number one, not all ideas are good ideas. I mean, AOC is pretty good evidence of that. I'm, I'm a big fan of some old ideas myself that I think are, are pretty good. But beyond that, I think that it is, it is intellectual uh, intellectual sneering of the highest order to suggest that only the left has, has new and decent ideas. Some of the ideas that are popular in your side of politics uh, would seem to take us back to the Dark Ages, Georgia, new abortion laws, uh, which you are much in favor of, uh, that uh, a woman who miscarries could get 30 years. A Georgian woman who travels to another state for an abortion procedure could get 10 years. These are extreme hard policies. Well, OK, a couple of things. One, I'm not sure. I mean, frankly, I don't know whether you're are you an objective journalist or are you an opinion journalist? I'm a Just journalist that asks questions. OK, so you're, in a, you're a supposedly objective journalist calling policies with which you disagree barbaric and no, suggesting I, only one side of the political aisle no. has ideas. So I just want to point Look, out that, no, I, know that I wish, you would, I, I wish I, you would at least be honest in your own biases. Uh, Mr. So Shapiro, are, are, are I know you, that you broadcasting the... in America is now so polarized that on one program you only have the left and another one you just have the right. My job well, is to question those who have strong views and put an alternative to them. If you were an anti-abortion well, anti well person, I would be putting 
pro-abortion questions to you, but you are really would you, an would, you, would you call the pro-choice person. position? So, so, so why don't so you just answer you my question, sir? Sir, I'm happy to answer your question. Please answer this one. Would you suggest? Would you suggest that a late-term abortion is brutal? I'm not taking a is view it a brutal on this policy issue. I'm to allow late-term abortion. Questions. Sir, you just suggested the pro-life position is inherently brutal and terrible, so I'm asking you, as an objective journalist, would you ask the same question to a pro-choice advocate by what, calling what their I'm, position brutal and horrible? What I'm asking you is that why is it that a bill banning abortions after a woman has been pregnant for six weeks is not a return to the dark ages? What's your answer? My answer is something called science. Human life exists at conception. It ought to be protected. Now, back to my question to you. You purport to be an objective journalist. BBC purports to be an objective down the middle network. It obviously is not, it never has been, and you as a journalist are proceeding to call one side of the political aisle ignorant, barbaric, and sending us back to the dark ages. Why don't you just say that you're on the left? Uh, is this so hard for you? Why can't you just be honest? <laughs> Mr. Seriously, Shapiro, I, it's a serious question. Mr. Shapiro, if you only knew how ridiculous that statement is, you wouldn't have said it. So let's move on. Um, would you vote I for Mr. Trump? Would you vote for Mr. Trump in 2020? I'd certainly consider voting for Mr. Trump in 2020, just like I'd consider voting for anybody else in 2020. Uh, but didn't you once say that you'd never vote for him? I said that I wouldn't vote for him in 2016. And then I wrote a column for National Review explaining the conditions under which I might change my mind. You're a, a, a culture war warrior. Isn't he largely on your side? You, you wrote once it was unlikely he'd appoint conservative judges to the Supreme Court. He has. Right. That so you true. were wrong. And so I'm at, I, I like many of President Trump's policies, even if I still have serious reservations about his personality and character. Do you think there's a Democrat that could beat him in 2020? Sure, I think there are several Democrats who could beat him in 2020. Who would have the best chance? I think that Joe Biden is likeliest to beat him, considering that he has significant appeal in a lot of the Rust Belt, in places like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, the places that President Trump needs to win to retain the presidency. And Joe Biden also has a long history in politics, which means that the American people already have sort of a preconceived vision of him. President Trump as a campaigner is very good at dragging unknowns through the mud mm. uh, or at exposing details about people that are previously sort of covered up. But when it comes to Joe Biden, he's been well exposed for a very long time. Most people know him and he's not nearly as unpopular even going in as Hillary Clinton was in 2016. So if it was a close race between Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump, you would, from what you say, I think, probably go for Mr. Trump. Yes, I would vote for Mr. Trump if it were a race between Biden and Trump, because I think that the damage that President Trump has done to the country on a character and rhetorical level has already been done and cannot be undone. I don't see it as getting worse day by day. That is the new status quo, unfortunately. Now the question becomes which policies I would most like to see enacted, and Trump's policy preferences are closer to my own than Joe Biden's are. Now, you're a star of new media, of conservative new media. Uh, you and others on the left and the right, you position yourselves as supposed tellers of hard truths. But haven't you all just really coarsened public discourse in America and exacerbated its divisions? You know, it's kind of odd to be to be hearing about me coarsening public discourse when you call policies you disagree with brutal and bringing us back to the dark ages, sir. Uh, the point I don't want to return to, but the point was to put a position for you to reply to it. And I thought we that, covered uh, that. that. That's but, well, well, I, I'll I put think some of the points too, because on your your, your videos, characterization of issues is part of the problem in the well, coarsening of public debate. Well, maybe it's also part of your problem too, because we have from your YouTube videos, Ben Shapiro destroys the abortion argument. Ben Shapiro destroys trans transgenderism and abortion. Is that not a kind of coarse public discourse? Well, are those videos labeled by me? I have no idea. But why are you picking out? Why are, why are you? Why are you? I have a question. Why are you picking out random YouTube videos are, put up by people who are not me? Are you and then attributing uh, the titles to me? Are you unhappy with the way they've been described? I think that people can describe me however they please. It's a free country, and I'm all in favor of a public, of a public debate. If you watch the actual clips, they are generally civil conversations between me and somebody who disagrees with me. You say in your new book, uh, you suggest that America's largest struggle at the moment is quote the struggle for our national soul. We are so angry at each other right now. And I, I think that's true. I've just returned from the United States. But aren't you part of the problem with the way you go about your discourse, not the solution? I think we can all do better in our discourse. But the fact that I've reached out to so many people across the aisle to have conversations with them is pretty evident. The fact that I was willing to walk from a publication that was paying me money over principle is pretty evident. The fact that I've called out President Trump, a member of a party of which I am a member, 
repeatedly when I think that he has done things that are immoral, I think is decent evidence that I'm looking at least for a civil conversation. Well, you, as you say in your book, you say that there's a quite a key phrase, we are so angry at each other right now. But as I say, aren't you part of that anger? Aren't you encouraging that anger? For example, you, des you described Mr. Obama's State of the Union address in 2012 as fascist mentality in action. Well, I think that if you, are want, if you want to argue with the characterization, then we can talk about what exactly his State of the Union address said. Is it charged language in politics? Sure. The problem that I have is not with charged language in politics, which I'm generally in favor of. I like a robust public debate and a very loud and, and, and spirited public debate. I have no problem with that whatsoever. What I'm talking about is the assumption that people with whom we disagree politically are inherently of bad character or, in your words, want to bring us back to the dark ages. But, again, it was your description of the State of the Union address in 2012 as fascist. That's... The wording of, of President Trump's 2012 address was bad and wrong. That's all. There are plenty of things that are bad and wrong, but it doesn't make them fascist. Well, I suppose that's true. But if you would like to, again, if you'd like to read me the column out loud, I suppose I can critique it for you. Oh, well, again, with Mr. Obama, you said, Jew, and you're, you're Jewish yourself, I only mention that because to put this in context, the Jews who vote for Obama are, by and large, Jews in name only, ginos, you call them. My statement was based on the fact that Jews in the United States, as an ethnic group, are largely irreligious, which is true by every single poll. Jews are the most irreligious group in the United States. As an Orthodox Jew who actually takes Judaism seriously, the point that I am making is that most Jews who are ethnically Jewish are not religiously Jewish no. in any context. No, no, no. The point you were making is that Jews who vote for Obama are Jews in name only. I said, I said that, yes, that is correct, that Jews yeah. who voted for Barack Obama, a progenitor of the Iran deal, a person who was cracking down on religious liberty, a person who spent much of his career as president of the United States attempting to deprive Israel of the necessities to defend itself, that, that people, Jews who voted for President Obama, by and large, cared about Judaism far less than they did about other priorities. Did you say they should Correct. turn their badge in as a Jew? Uh, yes, I believe that if you are a, I believe that if you are somebody who takes Judaism seriously, that comes along with ideological, ideological commitment. I mean, I guess. The, also, I'm just. I mean, I, I mean, I, I hope you're having fun. By the way, going through every old tweet that I've ever sent to try and do gotcha questions. But if you'd like to have a discussion about my general philosophy or things I've done in, say, I don't know, that's 2012, so it's now 2019. If you'd like to discuss something I've done in, say, like the past five years, why don't we do that? How about well, that? Well, because your book is uh, a criticism of uh, how angry America is and how America has to do better. And I'm simply I have an entire list out, on my website, sir. Sir, on I, my list, I have an entire website of I, dumb, I'm bad things that I've said. I'm simply trying to point out some of the things you, you've said that seem to me to help to stoke that anger. For example, you said sure. Israelis like to build, Arabs like to bomb crap and live in open sewage. Well, as I say in an article entitled, here's a list of all the giant, bad, dumb things I've ever said. Was that, that, was list that dumb? What? Yes, that's a dumb tweet. And not only, but it is also important to mention that the next few tweets clarify that that tweet is specifically referring to the Hamas leadership, which, no. by the way, a BBC I've, I've seen is relatively reticent to condemn. No, actually, it wasn't what you went on to do and say, uh, you are correct about the slur and our Arabs. It's not all Arabs that want to live in open sewage and blow things up. It's just Palestinians, you went on to say. No, it's, a, no, it's, and, a, no, it's just the said, ones who take sides against Israel the in the Israel-Palestinian conflict. And then you said the Palestinian Arab population is rotten to the core, you went on to say. Not Hamas. I say by, the yeah, Palestinian I say by poll, Arab population. I say that by poll numbers, they elected Hamas. They elected Hamas. They educate their children in school that Israel should be obliterated, sir. I guess... If you want to read... Con you know, honestly, uh, th this is a giant waste of time in the sense that the entire interview is designed for you to shout slogans or old things that I've said at me. I don't see how this forwards the debate. You talk about, you talk about undermining the public discourse. It seems to me that simply going through and finding lone things that sound bad out of context and then hitting them with, and then hitting people with them is a way for you to make a quick buck on BBC off the fact that I'm popular and no one has ever heard of you. Uh, there are not many bucks to be made on the BBC, unlike American broadcasting, Mr. Shapiro. Uh, I get, the point You're I'm trying paid, to make seems. is that your words are hardly designed to produce the consensus and understanding that the book seems to want to produce. Uh, that's my point, that you write about you know, Judeo-Christian culture and so on, but so much of what you've said in the past would seem to 
turn its back on Judeo-Christian culture. You're lecturing me on Judeo-Christian culture after you call the pro-life position barbaric? I, I just really? asked you a question. And I asked you a question. You failed to answer a single one of oh. mine. Well, Frankly, I find this whole thing a waste of time. If you want to read the book and critique the book, why don't you read and critique the book? If you want to, re if you want to critique me, you can think whatever you want of me. Why don't you frankly, just try and I don't answer care. the I don't, I don't frankly give a damn what you, you think of me since I've new, never heard of you. You, and I've never heard of you until I briefed myself for this, but that's not the issue. You have a then new why the book hell are you interviewing out, and it's, me, an in, it's an interesting book. But my point is your book claims that society... Well, it would be society, nice if you would quote it from time to time. Your book is... Well, actually, I've done so several times, and I'm about to do so again, if you would let me just finish the question. Your book now, frankly, claims I don't think that society you know honestly, is turning honestly, its back... Sir? on Judeo-Christian values. Yeah, this is, what are those values? What, considering that it's, what, what are the values it's turning its back on? I, I, you know, I, I'm not inclined to continue an interview with a person as badly motivated as you as an interviewer. So I think we're done here. I appreciate your time. All sir. right. Thank you well, so much. We, thank you for your time and uh, for showing that anger is not part of American political discourse. Now, Mr. Shapiro, we'll say goodbye.